Okay, thanks. Uh, so this paper is about uh, linear networks, which is like a very simplified uh, a neural network model where basically we take a vanilla feed-forward neural network and remove all the nonlinearities. So what we are left with is basically a function of the form X maps to X times a uh, product of uh, matrices, K matrices where K is a depth. Um, in terms of expressiveness, this is nothing more than a linear predictor. Uh, of course, uh, however, it's still an interesting model that people have studied in recent years because with this kind of reparameterization, it's a non-convex uh, learning problem, which is believed to capture uh, interesting aspects of optimization on real networks. Uh, you know, at the very least, if we want to understand the nonlinear neural networks, we should be able to understand linear ones. Um, this problem has some nice uh, geometric properties. So for example, it has been shown under very mild conditions that there are no bad uh, local minima, only global ones. Um, but still translating it to an explicit result for gradient-based uh, methods um, is still not quite well understood. There have been several papers in recent years by uh, people like Teng Yuma and Moritz Hart and Peter Bartlett, Phil Long, David Helmbolt and others, uh, but still we don't um, know how to analyze the convergence of gradient-based methods in general um, for these kinds of networks. Uh, so, um, to try and get a sense uh, of things, let's consider an extremely, extremely special case of this uh, problem, uh, where we look at networks which are not only linear, they're also one-dimensional, okay? So every matrix WI is just a scalar, uh, and we just look at the product uh, of these on one-dimensional inputs. Uh, moreover, let's suppose we just want to fit a single data point. For example, on given the input one, we want the network to predict minus one. And using the squared loss, this boils down to, uh, you know, trying to optimize this uh, a very complicated optimization problem. Uh, I have to say that setting-wise, this is probably my most embarrassing cold paper so far. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, let's consider vanilla gradient descent with basically any kind of standard random initialization you may want, uh, Javier or um, some other standard uh, initialization. Uh, so this setting is so simple that even I could uh, analyze it. Um, but the result is maybe a little bit unexpected. So gradient descent will converge here, but uh, the number of iterations required under very mild conditions is basically exponential in the depth. Uh, and this is also tight up to logarithmic factors in the exponent. So uh, once the depth is even moderately large, uh, this, this simple problem becomes intractable for a gradient descent. Uh, moreover, this also happens under more general data assumptions than uh, what I show here. Um, and also, even though we can't analyze it theoretically, uh, empirically we can show that this also happens uh, in higher dimensions where um, it's not one dimensional but uh, higher dimensional and if I'll have time maybe we'll see it later on. Um, so why is this interesting? Of course, uh, no one actually uses one-dimensional linear neural networks, but I think it's interesting for a couple of reasons. So first of all, it highlights a potential obstacle to trying to get you know, a positive result for deep linear networks. Uh, at the very least, uh, such an analysis would need to circumvent this result uh, somehow. So for example, most uh, existing analyses don't really depend on the width of the network. And if you don't depend on the width, then uh, any kind of positive result would also have to apply to one-dimensional networks, uh, and then you run into this exponential dependency on the depth problem. Uh, also, I think it's an interesting example of a situation where adding depth uh, very quickly makes a trivial problem, uh, you know, just uh, learning a linear predictor into an intractable one for gradient descent, which kind of runs uh, counter to uh, many recent papers um, in the literature, which uh, sort of the prevailing sentiment is that you make your network larger, wider, deeper, things only uh, improve. For example, there was a very nice recent paper by Aurora Cohen and Hazan showing how adding depth um, makes the optimization easier. Here we show at least in some simple cases, uh, the very opposite uh, occurs. Um, okay, the proof itself is rather technical, but uh, luckily the high, level proof ideas are very simple. Um, so again, focusing on this uh, optimization problem, um, 
So first of all, geometrically, kind of the problem is that at the origin, you have um, what is known as a high order saddle point. So it's a point where the gradient and the Hessian and even high order derivatives are all zero. And it's also surrounded by a region which is very, very flat. So gradient descent has a problem tackling this. And basically our observation is that uh, no matter what kind of random initialization you do, gradient descent has a very hard time uh, avoiding this high order uh, saddle point. And hence you get this exponential depth dependence. A, a little bit more uh, in detail, um, so for example, if you do like a standard, uh, what is known as Javier initialization, uh, so in this case it would boil down to picking each WI IID from some zero mean unit variance uh, distribution, um, and that uh, leads, th this is the whole intuition of this kind of initialization, is that the variance of the output with respect to this initialization is also well behaved, it will be one. Um, but here is a very simple fact that is maybe uh, interesting in this context. So you can make the variance well behaved, but that doesn't mean that the actual distribution uh, of the network would be well behaved. So actually, for just about any distribution uh, that you can pick, if it means zero and various one, with high probability, you're going to end up at a point which is very, very close to zero. You're essentially going to get a distribution which is, with overwhelming probability, will be very close to zero. And with extremely small probability, it would be some huge number. So the variance is okay, but not the other moments. Um, and once you're, uh, you get a small value, you get close to this harder saddle point, and you're in trouble. Uh, but people have also studied other types of initializations for these networks. So for example, uh, near identity, where you initialize each WI to be close to one. Um, this is motivated by residual networks. I won't go into the details. Uh, and here also gradient descent fails, but for a somewhat different reason. Um, and to explain the intuition, um, maybe it's best just to see like a run of gradient descent uh, um, on a particular example. So here is uh, when you pick k equals seven, a depth seven uh, network. The left plot shows the evolution of the objective function. So it very quickly decreases to one, then stalls. It gets stuck there for a very long time. Uh, and eventually it goes to uh, zero, but in between uh, there's a long time where you're uh, stuck. And the reason for this uh, is very easy to see once you track the evolution of the individual parameters, the wi um, from one till seven. So this is the right plot uh, where each one uh, refers to a different uh, wi. So gradient descent, uh, you know, it's a greedy algorithm. So all the wi start close to one and initially Gradient descent simply tries to decrease uh, each of them uh, because that's uh, how you uh, uh, myopically decrease uh, the uh, objective function. But once the WI start decreasing, their product very quickly gets extremely close to zero and then it's easy to show that the gradient is also kind of exponentially close to zero. And eventually one of the WIs will shift sign and then things would be okay, but the time till we reach this point is exponential in the depth. Um, so as I said, this is just for one dimensional network, but uh, empirically we can also see a very similar behavior even in uh, higher uh, dimensions where our kind of our proof technique uh, doesn't necessarily hold. Uh, so for example, if you take the multi-dimensional analog where now W is a 25 by 25 matrix and you try to mimic the identity a predictor, um, you also get a behavior which uh, is very clearly exponential in the depth. So like if you plot like a semi-log uh, uh, plot, the number of iterations you need increases exponentially in the depth. And essentially once your depth is more than uh, eight, um, then even if you run gradient descent for a billion iterations, which is a ridiculously large number for a network this size, you're just not uh, going to uh, converge. Um, and this happens if you do a uh, Javier or you do other things and you can see more details um, in our poster. Um, finally, this uh, paper has uh, maybe an interesting postscript. So after we posted our, uh, okay. So what we show is that if the uh, width of the network, the dimension of uh, the WIs is one or maybe a small constant, uh, gradient descent takes exponentially many iterations to converge. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, after our paper was posted online, uh, so Simon Du and Wei Hu had a very um, interesting uh, uh, paper, which I believe was presented uh, this uh, ICML, where if you make uh, the width sufficiently uh, large, uh, okay, so polynomial in the data size and the uh, condition number of the problem and the depth and uh, so on, um, then actually gradient descent converges in time which is, at least in terms of the depth, only logarithmic um, in it. So we have this like very uh, dramatic difference where um, making the network sufficiently wide or sufficiently over-parameterized, namely wider than what you would need in order to express a good predictor, um, improves the convergence double exponentially, from exponential in the depth to logarithmic in the depth, and um, this is provably necessary because of this combination of upper and lower uh, bounds. Um, However, that still uh, leaves the question of what happens in between. So if you make the network extremely wide, things are okay. If the network is narrow, uh, things are not okay. What happens, you know, for more moderate widths? What happens in between? Is there a sharp phase transition? Is it more gradual? Uh, and I think that might be an interesting open question to think about. So that's it. Thanks. Um, so again, not with the standard initializations that uh, people use. For example, if you do this near identity initialization, uh, it won't uh, work. I should emphasize, it's not, I'm, it's not that I'm claiming it's a hard problem. You know, you can figure out an initialization which would work. But the point is that, you know, with this algorithm, with standard initializations, you run into a problem. So if you want to show a positive result for this algorithm, this is something you need to handle. Uh, yes, that's so correct. Um, so we're definitely using the fact, so you know this phenomena that one of the WIs eventually crosses uh, does use the fact that you're taking discrete uh, uh, steps. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, you're going to get to zero and you're going to get stuck there. Um, that's a good question. So the, so the problem is that in one dimension, uh, I mean, our proof works because you know, you're, you're at a positive, your prediction is positive, you want to make it negative, you have to go through zero. More dimensions, you know, maybe you go around it uh, somehow and things become trickier. So I can't say uh, for sure, maybe, you know, gradient flow would still work in more dimensions. I mean, definitely in the regime where, which Simon do analyze, gradient flow would also work. <laughs> 